Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> and to everybody who is watching online, welcome back um, to our summer lunchtime Bible study, which we've only done this a couple times. I'm having so much fun. This is so much fun. I love doing this kind of stuff. This is just the best thing in the world. And, and the reason for that is, um, um, good afternoon, Alaric. Um, Alaric Hildreth is watching us online. So um, everybody's greeting. You know, this is, this is a great opportunity for us to um, dig into some scriptures that we hear on Sunday mornings. And we get bits and pieces of them. And the interesting thing about getting those bits and pieces is that essentially the three-year lectionary, which is what we've got, gives us a read-through of not the whole Bible, obviously, but a good chunk of it. And that was always the reason. The reason was to, it used to be for the longest period of time in the history of the church, that there was a one-year lectionary cycle. And so you got the same texts on the same Sundays every year from Advent all the way through, right? And then at the latter half of the 20th century, I think it was the 1960s, 1970s, they decided that we wanted to expand that because we wanted to read more of the Bible. And so that's what happened. And so each of the three years is essentially following a particular, um, one of the Gospels. And so we're in the year um, Mark, uh, year of Mark. It's, yeah, if somebody could um, get the door, that would be awesome. Um, this, this is the wonderful thing. Um, I remember a couple times during um, the pandemic when things were really, you know, it was just <laughs> me on my, in my, uh, <laughs> on my way. There we are. Um, all of a sudden, somebody would ring the doorbell and it's like, well, I could, I guess I could go. So, so what we have there are, um, we're in the year of Mark, and so we will read most of the Gospel of Mark um, throughout the course of this church year. And then Matthew and Luke are the way it goes. And then you intersperse the Gospel of John in all of that. So we get a lot of the scriptures, but we get it in these little bite-sized pieces. Um, and like today you can see that there is a theme in the four scriptures that we've got for the Sunday coming up. And that theme is the shepherd or shepherds. We see it in Jeremiah um, 23, and I'll go through each of these one by one. Jeremiah 23, um, Psalm 23, which everybody knows, um, Ephesians, and then Mark. And I will take my time through each one of these. The theme of a shepherd is something that we will hear throughout these texts. But I want to tell you something. I want to tell you a story. Um, a seminary classmate of mine, who actually sometimes watches our Bible studies, um, and so I'm telling stories literally out of school. Um, it was in our first preaching class. So we were first-year seminarians, and we were doing, it was our first time doing live preaching in front of people. Now, it was our classmates and our professor, right? I'll guarantee you this. Nobody's sermons in those, in those classes were any good. None of us were any good at this. We were all just, we were brand new. We were learning. It was, we were terrible. I just want to say that up front. <laughs> but my friend, who's um, still a pastor today, um, <laughs> he had one of the Good Shepherd texts. And so he thought, and, you know, it is a part of his sermon, he would talk about what shepherds do with the sheep, right? And this is one of those things that doesn't fly at all in sermons because the implications are pretty profound. Because one of the things that shepherds do with sheep, shepherds, sheep that run away, especially little ones, you know how you make sure that a sheep doesn't run away anymore? You train them not to run away? Guess what you would do with a sheep that, you know, and so you always see the cozy little pictures of a shepherd with a, a, usually a small lamb or a sheep over his shoulder and he's holding the legs. You know why that's happened? He broke their legs. A shepherd will break one of the sheep's legs <laughs> 
so that they learn to trust the shepherd to, for dependency, um, and they won't go. So in his first sermon, right, he talks about the shepherd breaking sheep legs. And I'm thinking, I don't think that's going to be received in the way that you think that it's probably going to be received. And the professor of the preaching class, he goes, I wouldn't use that from the pulpit. Uh, just, just an idea. Right. And, and, and so the very notion of it is, that's the last thing that you, when you're thinking about the good shepherd, you're not thinking of Jesus going, okay, I know how we're going to keep you on the ranch. Probably not a good idea. Um, you learn these things. You learn not to say these things. Now, it's, it, the thing is, is it, was this true? Did this actually happen? Yes. Is that something that you really want to share um, as a way of thinking about this? No. But here's the interesting thing. In the first lesson that we're going to look at today, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6, it does talk about shepherds, but it talks about shepherds who have done things wrong. And that's where we start, right? The interesting thing about Jeremiah, and now if you for those, some of you have actually watched my whole long series on Jeremiah. And if you haven't seen the whole thing, it's on our YouTube channel and you can actually find it on our Facebook page. Um, we have gone through the entire book of Jeremiah slowly, carefully, methodically, and it was a lot of fun. But one of the interesting things about this part of Jeremiah is that this isn't a time when God is through Jeremiah, celebrating the shepherds in the beginning. Because the beginning of chapter 23 says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherded my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So, I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. And so the beginning of this text in Jeremiah, this is really about God saying to the shepherds. Now, who are the shepherds, do you think? Who, if, if we're going to, you know, because these are, this is very much a specific person or group of people that um, Jeremiah is uh, giving this oracle to. Who do you think were the shepherds of ancient Israel? What's that? Okay. Um, pastors or priests? Yes, but even more importantly, and even more specifically, they're kings. The kings were seen as the shepherds of the flock. Remember, in ancient Israel, the king was anointed by the priest, meaning that they were somebody who was named by God to be king, right? or at least anointed by God, lifted up by the people, the stirring of wisdom and of God. And so their call, the king's call, was from Yahweh God. That's what they were supposed to do. And so these kings, which God never liked in the first place, right? The whole notion of kings are a bad idea. Um, before kings, they had judges, and that was a better way of governing because it was more community-based. It wasn't as hierarchical, right? If you've got a king, they're going to think that they get to make all the decisions. That's the problem with kings. And God was like, you don't really want a king. And the people were like, we want kings. And he's like, that's a bad idea. And so they're the shepherds. They're the ones who are supposed to shepherd the people of Israel. Judah and Israel, they're the ones who lead them. That's what a shepherd does. Guide, protect, lead. What if the shepherds don't do what they're supposed to do? That's what Jeremiah is talking about here. Jeremiah is saying the kings have failed. Just like God said they were going to fail. They failed. They've led the people astray. And not only have they just not done their job, they have been very determined in making the people do exactly opposite of what they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? 
that's, that's really the thing. It's not just that you've had a couple of bad kings who were not good at it. It's that they were spectacularly good at doing the wrong things, at doing evil things. Everything that Israel was supposed to be doing, they're like, let's go the other direction. I'm in charge. Who cares about what God thinks? And so this is an oracle calling these shepherds on the carpet. You've scattered the sheep. You've done this wrong. That's what the people have done. And so that's the problem, right? The problem is that God gave them a path, gave them the covenant, gave them the law, and said, do these things, and you'll live. And they're like, nah, we got it. We'll do it ourselves. And God's like, don't do that. It's going to get bad. Jeremiah is the story of when things go completely bad. Judah, um, Israel has is fallen to the Assyrians by this point. Um, the northern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom, is about to get um, invaded by the Babylonians. Jerusalem itself will fall. The temple will be destroyed in 587. And God is now to the point of saying, you know what, Jeremiah, don't warn him anymore. They're going to have to pay the penalty of all of this evil doing, of doing the wrong thing. The only way they're going to learn is if it all goes away, if it all falls. They're going to get hauled away into exile and I don't want you to preach against that. I don't want you to stop it. I want you to tell them that's the only way they're going to learn. And that's what I was thinking about my friend who said, the shepherds break the legs of the sheep. Unfortunately, in this case in Jeremiah, that's essentially what's happening. God's like, you haven't learned any other way. It's like, you're so stubborn, you're so bullheaded that you cannot get it into your heads to do things the right way. And so we're going to have to do this the extreme way. Jeremiah is not a book that is treating any of this lightly. And so, but what's interesting, and as I mentioned in the, the longer Bible study, it's, it's really important to understand, though, that God does not walk away. As frustrated as God is, as angry as God is, as ready to throw in the towel as God is. And in Jeremiah, we hear it. I mean, right here. I mean, he's ready. The, the shepherds, they did the, the wrong thing. And it's all going to fall apart. But there's still God saying, but, but. And that's why this is so important, because verses 3 and 4, right, tells you what God will do. So this is um, Jeremiah chapter 23. Now we're to 3 and 4. Then I gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. And so God's like, these guys have screwed things up. When the remnant returns, when the exiles return, I'll be the one that brings them home. I will bring, be the one who then says, okay, we're going to give you a shepherd, but I'm going to be the one who directly says this is who it's going to be. And so you see, this is God saying, these things are going to happen. I get it. But I'm going to bring you home. And we're going to start over. Which leads us to 5 and 6, which is probably the most well-known, in many ways, of the Jeremiah passages. We hear it all the time during the season of Advent. Because what it says is, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David, right, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved 
and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our right. What we're getting in this is not just that the previous shepherds were terrible, so they're gone. I will save the people. I will bring them back. I'll, the remnant will return. The exiles will come home. And they'll come home safe and whole and sound. And then I'm going to lift up a new shepherd. And yes, this is um, a direct reference to a future Messiah. Somebody who will be the anointed one, which is what a Messiah means. So you always wonder, you, you wonder why the people of Israel think, oh, is Jesus the Messiah? And then they thought king. Well, Messiah, anointed one, who gets anointed? Kings get anointed. And so they were assuming that it was going to be a king. But a king, and this is really important, who is going to live up to the standards that God had set. And so we get that language, right? Somebody who deals wisely. Somebody who shall execute justice um, and righteousness. Um, that's the high bar that God had been expecting the shepherds all along to measure up to. And so what God is, yeah, there's going to be a new Messiah. There's going to be a new shepherd. But that shepherd is going to hit the standard. Right? And so both Jews and Christians look at this and say, well, that's the Messiah. Right? And Christians understand from our, you know, our theological understanding is that means that that's pointing to Jesus, who lives up to those standards, right? Wisdom, justice, righteousness. That's where we're looking at. And so in a, in a just a few short verses, we see the whole march, essentially, of salvation history. Our fall, God's rescue, the return or the coming of the Messiah. Six verses. That's some pretty economical writing, right? Especially because it comes right in the middle of this long prophetic lament. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet because he's weeping in lament for the people of Israel. Does he want them to fail? No. Did God want them to fail? No. Did God want them to run the other direction so dramatically? Absolutely not. And neither did Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of them, right? And so this opening text for this week is really the whole story of God's salvation history right there. It's no wonder we use it in those, especially verses 5 and 6 in Advent, when we're talking about the coming of the King or the coming of the Messiah, the, the one who will be God incarnate. And it's important then because it sets the stage for the rest of the texts on this Sunday, you know, because we go then next to Psalm 23, which may be the most well-known psalm, song, poem in all of Scripture, right? Um, and it's really important to recognize a couple of little things about this. One, we've read it so many times, we've stopped hearing it. And so, here's the thing for you to do this week. Read it out loud at home to yourself or to somebody else. But don't read it like you've always read it. Take some time. Think about it. Um, because it's what is, its category is a trust psalm, right? Um, the psalms have been categorized by biblical scholars, and we essentially, we look at them, and there's all these different categories. Well, this is a trust psalm. A trust psalm expresses faith and confidence in God in the middle of turmoil. So when you get one of these trust psalms, and there's like a dozen of them in all of the psalms, they're always speaking about trust and confidence in God in the middle of the crisis, not after the crisis is gone. Those are usually um, 
Thanksgiving psalms, which we get, you know, we lift our Thanksgiving because God's got us through this. This is really about still being in the middle of the, of the crisis, of the danger or the threat or the difficulty. So Psalm 23 is really good at any time when we're in the middle of a mess. Because that's what it really speaks to, right? Um, and so we begin, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, there may be a better way of saying it. Um, there's an old scholar named Eugene Peterson. He said, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. And then he goes on and he, he just paraphrases the rest of it. But I love that. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. Because that really starts to say what we it's not that we need something, it's just that we are in God's presence, in the midst of trouble, and oftentimes that's help all by itself. Um, it's an interesting thing. I, somebody did some work on this. There are 55 words in this poem. The word you is the word that comes right in the middle. It's the 28th word, so that's absolutely, and this is in English, you know, but so it's a little bit different. But you, as in you are with me. And so what is interesting is that the center, the literal center of this is us saying to God that you are in our presence. You're with us. That's what the shepherd is supposed to do. That's what a shepherd is supposed to be, with. Right, And so when the psalmist writes, your rod and your staff, they come for me, a rod, a shepherd uses two sticks, essentially. A rod keeps the wolves at bay or the dogs at bay. The staff, the one with the hook on it, keeps them from straying, right? And so your rod and your staff, they come for me, right? It protects and keeps us close. Those are the things that are happening in this. And so you're not, you don't have rods when there are no dogs around, right? Or wolves around or trouble around. You need the shepherd to you as well as keep you close. Um, this is why bishops carry um, what is called a crozier. It looks like a shepherd's crook, right? Stick with the hook on it. Um, because that's an understanding of the pastoral action of the church. Um, the bishop is the pastor to the pastors in many ways. And their job is not only to defend us, but to keep us from straying. <laughs> and so when we talk about, when say when Bishop Chris were to come for a visit, um, he brings the staff, not because it's a cool thing, but because it's a symbol of great importance, right? We don't use these symbols lightly. It reminds us that as clergy, especially, we're supposed to be shepherds. That's what pastor is translated as, right? Somebody who is a pastor is a shepherd. That's literally the translation. Protect, keep safe, but also keep in line. <laughs> and so Psalm 23, it's it really speaks to a moment, a moment of standing in the middle of a mess and saying, God, you're with me. And that, that is the gift that we need. As we've been wandering through this pandemic, one of the things that's kept us grounded is the fact that we know that God has been with us. It's not going to fix the problem. It's not going to make the bad things go away. And notice, this doesn't say that there's not going to be trouble. The person who wrote Psalm 23 was in the middle of a crisis. They knew that. We're never praying that God just make it magically disappear. We're just saying, just be with us in the midst of it. Because more than anything, the bad things are never going to go away. But if we've got somebody who walks with us, and that's why the congregation is so important. That's why I've been essentially nagging everybody to reach out and you know contact people. And we reach out because a lot of times what people need to hear is that they're not alone. And this has been a time when people have felt isolated and scared. 
And sometimes you just need somebody to say, I'm with you. I can't fix it, but we're together. That's not going to solve the problem, but it gives us the strength and the courage in a little moment of peace to say, okay, I can take another step. Psalm 23 does that. Um, especially if we kind of think about it in very specific places, in very specific times, um, it helps. All right, so that's Psalm 23. And it's really, I cannot stress this enough. Read it out loud this week for yourself or for somebody else. And read it like you've never read it before. Take each line. Think about it. Pray about it. Lift it up. Because I think sometimes when we've heard things so often, we stop hearing them. So get yourself in a different situation, in a different environment, and read it. And I find that's true for all scripture, right? And the other thing is this. Scripture was always meant to be read aloud, right? I mean... Is not to, not to be read. In the ancient world, the vast majority of people were illiterate. Not for any other reason than they didn't really need to learn how to read and write because there wasn't a lot of reading and, or there wasn't a lot of written material other than for scholars and scribes and all the other kind of stuff. The scripture, the vast majority of it, was passed down orally, right? Generation to generation to generation. Yeah, scholars are going to write this stuff down but not right away. Um, remember, even the Gospels weren't written down until 30 years after Jesus had been raised. And that's because the people of Jesus' generation, they knew the stories. They started writing it down because they wanted to be able to have an ability to share it longer distance. Right? And so... Like the Psalms. The Psalms were all, that's the original hymnody, the songs of the ancient Israelites. In their worship, they sang the Psalms. Still do. So do we. Right? And so when we speak them out loud, we're doing the thing that it's always been done. Um, that's why some of these, when you know, especially the Psalms, if you listen to them when they're set to music, they hit in different ways. And they stick with you. Um, so most of this, right, would have been heard, not read. And sometimes we're such a, a, literar, a, a literate society, which is a good thing, but it also means that sometimes we don't hear it out loud. That's why when we come to church on Sunday, it's so important, right? Because we hear scripture. And that's the way that we've been hearing scripture since the very beginning, right? In the community. And there's the other part of it. So when you read it, at home, for yourself or if there's somebody else, that's a good thing. But then when you're here on Sunday and you hear the community speaking it, saying it, all of a sudden it resonates in different ways. Treasure both. Hear it both ways. And I think that's, you know, to me, that's just one of those things that um, so many of the stories that my kids know by heart were read to them. You know, we read to our kids when they were little every night. And they learned so much through that simple art of storytelling. And that's how they learned their scripture, right? Because they've heard it. Week after week after week after week, but they've heard it. They've heard it in, in different voices. And that's the other thing. That's what I love about, you know, um, worship on Sundays is that we get to hear, we raise up different voices and we hear because everybody's going to put a different emphasis on it, right? What hits them in the moment? Because I guarantee you, whoever reads it this Sunday, the last time they read it in service, they read it differently. And I think that that's a gift. That's an absolute gift. Every single time we do that. All right. So, or the second lesson that we would learn, is Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22. 
And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on this because I want to jump right to the gospel. But there's something really unique about this because the whole business here in Ephesians is, remember, Paul's writing to a large community um, of growing Christians. Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey, right? Asia Minor at the time. Um, and, and into Greece, right? So it's, we're talking about the Greek-speaking world, um, which pretty much was everything at this point. But this wasn't originally a Jewish community in Ephesus. And so as he's writing to this community, and it's not about specific things, about the whole story of who Jesus is and what Jesus does, He's speaking to a community that is really quite new and different. And so that's why in the beginning, right, and so it's Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22, and I'm just going to begin reading this, and it says, So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. I want to focus on that for just a moment. Likely as not, the original group at Ephesus probably thought that Christianity was pagan of, in origin because it wouldn't have known that much about Judaism. Judaism was still a fairly small regional religion that didn't spread throughout the entire Mediterranean world. Now, if you went essentially east as opposed to west or down into Egypt, you would have had more Jewish communities, right? So Egypt, um, present-day Iraq, Iran, um, those kinds of regions, Saudi Arabia, there would have been Jewish communities kind of scattered throughout. But throughout the rest of the Mediterranean world, especially up Turkey, Greece, and towards Rome, some, but they would have been fairly small. All right. So what that means is that the people in Ephesus would have been like, wow, this Jesus guy, where did he come from? No idea, right? And so what is being done here is it's connecting and reconnecting Jesus back to his Jewish roots. And this is saying that we're one big family, that Gentiles, i.e. people who were not Jews, and the Jews are all the same people of God's promises. We are one, united in Jesus. And so this is an interesting thing because what they're doing, what Paul is doing in this letter is saying, you're not two different distinct groups. It's not us and them. It's just us. And the whole business of the uncircumcision and the circumcision, well, the Jews circumcised their young boys. The, most of the people in the ancient Mediterranean world did not. And so they thought, that, well, that's a distinctly, you know, that's an odd thing. But in Jesus, or what Paul is saying is like, don't, that's not a thing. That's not, your, you know, that's a human institution. This transcends that. We are one because we are made one in Christ, regardless of what cultural things we may do differently. And boy, is that not something that the world needs to hear right now. Right? That the walls that we may put up, Jesus is like, nope, there aren't any. We're one in what God does, not because what we do, we divide each other. We put up walls, we put up barriers, we make distinctions. And what Paul is saying in this is that Jesus has swept away those distinctions, that we are one, right? And so this is an important thing because it's telling the people of Ephesus two things. One, you're a part of this, right? Even though you weren't there at the beginning, you're a part of this. And two, so are the Jews. 
There's, you know, we're not going to separate them out. Because here's an interesting and, and a very problematic thing. Once we get past the first couple of generations of Christians, the Christian communities, starting in the late 90s and in the 100s, pretty much after the Second Temple was destroyed in 70, they start blaming the Jews for what happened to Jesus, which begins the long, ugly march of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. That starts almost from the very beginning. One of the earliest biblical scholars, a guy named Marcion, who was in the second century, said, we're just going to dump the entire Old Testament. It doesn't pertain to us. Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N. And all the other scholars were like, oh, no, that's, that's not right. <laughs> that is missing what Jesus himself was telling us, and that is we're one in what God has done, right? And so, but Christianity, unfortunately, has nurtured this anti-Semitic and anti-Judaic strain almost from the very beginning, even though the early church said, no, that's wrong. And so we see that here, even here, that the people of Ephesus are being told, You're, we're one in Christ. The people of the promise are the people of the promise. Um, Martin Luther, early on in his career, um, during the time of the Reformation, will say about the Jewish people, before he lost his mind about the whole thing, um, he will say, they are the people of the promise. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, right? Okay, and we say, well, what about Jesus? He says, okay, we know that, but here's the thing. We should never get in the habit of reading the mind of God. And that's a really good piece of advice. In this particular case, people are like, we know that because of Jesus, that God has rejected the Jews. That's what Christians will say during the Middle Ages. They still say it today. Guess what God never says anywhere in Scripture? The Jews have been rejected. God doesn't say it. If God doesn't say it, we can't say, but I think God said it. And that's what Luther was saying. You're, because people will say, well, that's what God would have said. Did he? No, didn't. So stop it. <laughs> right? It's don't say that God said something when God clearly didn't say it. Don't read the mind of God. Now, of course, when Luther got old and cantankerous, he will completely ignore his own advice and say, God rejected them. And he writes some virulently hateful things about the Jews. A terrible. One of the last things he wrote, and just the title alone tells you everything you need to know about the book, it was called On the Jews and Their Lies. Well, I mean, in that particular, theologically, he just, he jumped the tracks. I mean, in 1983, and again in 1993, the Lutheran churches in America put out statements apologizing to the Jews for Luther's virulently hateful um, writings. And that was the right thing for us to do. We repented of, of that great evil. Um, and the Lutheran church's stance is that the Jews are the people of the promise. How God's going to work that out ain't up to us. And so our job is to love them as fellow members of God's family. And so Lutherans don't try to convert Jews. It's, you know, because they're the people of the promise. They're the people of the covenant. We'll let God sort that out. But there are. Um, but we also recognize that it's a big, complicated thing, and God will is a God of mercy, and so we will err on the side of grace. i rather make the mistake of being open and inclusive to our Jewish brothers and sisters than to do anything that would go against what God has 
teaches us. And so that's a, I think it's a healthier way of looking at things. Um, because clearly, that's what Paul's trying to do here. He's trying to say, we're one. Yeah, the business about the law and the covenant and all that kind of good stuff. And yes, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. That doesn't mean the law disappears. Just because the law has been fulfilled in Christ doesn't mean that we stop following the commandments. Because that's what we're saying. A lot of people say, Jesus has fulfilled the law, which seems to be a get-out-of-jail-free card for actually following all the things that God tells us to do. Oh, I don't have to follow the Ten Commandments. That's not what Jesus is saying. <laughs> but a lot of people will go there. Oh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to listen to anything. Mm -mm -mm. That's not what's going on. Jesus, has, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, right? Last time I checked, when I looked in the mirror, that wasn't Jesus, right? Which means I still need to live. Now, I am free because of what Jesus has done for me to live my life in gracious response to that free gift, right? I don't have to work my way into heaven, but I still have to live in grateful response to what God has done in Jesus, and that means <laughs> following the Ten Commandments and doing all those other things like doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly. These are not things that pen us in. These are things that we are freed to now do. That's what's being talked about here. And so our Jewish um, brothers and sisters, they're doing the same thing. We're one family. We'll let God... You know, and I'd rather err on the side of grace. If I'm going to make a mistake, that's the way I'm going to make it. And I think that's what we're being called to do. Right? So, but all of this, by this uniting Jew and Gentile into one family of faith, one body, we're no longer strangers and aliens. There are no strangers and aliens. It's citizens and members of one household. That's what Paul writes. We are citizens and and members of one household. I think that's really important nowadays for us to think about. I mean, just absolutely, because we're really good at dividing, aren't we? We're really good at discriminating. We're really good at building walls. And what Paul is saying, don't, because that's the way that Jesus was going as well. That's what Jesus was telling us all along, which brings us to Mark, right? And so all of this, right, we get the notion of what a shepherd's supposed to look like in Jeremiah. We see what it means to be shepherded in Psalm 23. In Ephes in the Ephesians, what we're really getting is a sense of the fact that um, God is going to be the shepherd for all people. All people. You know, we're one big family of faith. I don't that phrase that I use all the time is not an accident. Right? Because that's the, that's the idea, that's the framework that we are living in. The other thing about a family is that we know that we're not always going to get along and we're not always going to agree. Notice, it doesn't say uniformity, it says unity. Those are two different things. So it's, it's really important for us to recognize that. Um, we can have differences of opinion. We can have vigorous conversation. Um, sometimes we can even have, you know, controversy. <laughs> but we're still one family. We're still in one group together. So, which leads us then to Mark, chapter 6. And now this is one of those unique <laughs> couplings of texts because... Um, we see that it's chapter 6, verses 30 through 34, and then 53 through 56. We're thinking, well, what's in between both of those two things? Well, what's in between both those two things is the feeding of the 5,000. And so what the author or the people who put the lectionary together are, they want to highlight two little stories before and after this great big feeding. Because... Frankly, the feeding of the 5,000 and immediately after that, Jesus walks on water, right? Those are two huge events. 
and we're going to give all the focus to them. But what the folks who are putting the lectionary together, they want to make sure that we don't miss these two really important little stories. Um, and in many ways, what's interesting about them is that we, they're often called like summary statements There's these, or transition statements. Um, Jesus is on the way to something. Or the uh, Mark is standing back and saying, okay, and now this, you know, I want to kind of get everybody's heads right before we go off and do the next thing. Well, 30 to 34 describes the return of the disciples from their first major ministry trip. Right? Remember, before this, immediately before this is the death of John the Baptist. And just before that was the sending of the twelve. And so Mark's now coming back, and they are pumped. They have stories to tell. They are excited. They are filled with the Spirit. And what's really interesting is that Jesus is like, yeah, I get it, but you know what you need more than anything right now? Time to rest and regroup and debrief and contemplate and reflect on everything that you've just experienced and everything that you've just done. Jesus is saying, I know you guys are raring to go, but what you need before you go off to the next thing is a moment to breathe. Because we know that the next big things are eating of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. And so the ministry is just going to kind of explode from this point on. This is the last time that Jesus essentially gets the disciples by himself in the story. And so in many ways, this is a way for Jesus to shepherd the disciples. Never says the word, but that's what he's doing. He's saying, oh, guys, you need a moment. You've just done this huge thing. I mean, they were curing people. They were casting out demons. They were preaching the good news. They've got stories to tell, right? The apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. And what's really interesting is I think something that I'm often guilty of is that we rush headlong thing next, you know, and we never take a moment to breathe. Right? We pack our schedules. We go, you know, and we think... If I'm busy, then I'm doing something, then I'm fine. And Jesus is like, you guys need to stop. You need to pray. You need to reflect on the things that are going on. You need a moment. And notice something, especially in the Gospel of Mark. This is really important because Mark, one of his favorite words is immediately. Immediately they go do this. Immediately Jesus does that. Immediately, I mean, he's, Mark is concise and he's got Jesus on the go all the time and so we tend to think that Jesus is busy 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 except for the fact that Jesus rests and prays because Jesus knows that you can't continue to run yourself ragged and be productive and so he needs he knows what's going to come up and he needs the disciples centered calmed, reflective, prayerful. That's what needs to happen. And so this little story, we get this little thing, right? Because then he's, he starts to open up exactly what's going to happen next, right? It says, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat, right? Jesus knew they needed a break. Have you ever been so busy that you didn't have time to eat? <laughs> Those kinds of days usually end with you just dropping into bed and you don't sleep very well because you're exhausted. You're so tired, you can't sleep. Right? And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. They hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion because they were like sheep and he began to Jesus knew the disciples needed a moment. But he also recognized the people needed a shepherd. 
And there's something really important about this text is that there's that little word and Jesus had compassion. But he didn't just feel sorry for them. He had compassion, which led to teaching them. They don't have a shepherd, now they've got one. It's a little thing. And it speaks volumes to who Jesus is. Jesus, as he's taking care of the disciples, takes care of the people next. But what's really interesting is then we're going to skip over the two big stories. We're going to skip the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to skip the walking on water. And we're going to go down to this, verses 53 to 56. And you're thinking, why? Well, it's a fascinating little story, isn't it? I mean, it's just a fascinating, absorbing little story. Because it says, when they had crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring him to wherever he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and bent the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. And so we've got this kind of general generic story about the fact that Jesus is healing the sick. And you're thinking, okay, well, so, I mean, it's great. This is awesome. Well, Mark uses it in a way that is, we call a summary statement. This is coming at the end of a chapter. And Mark is taking this and saying, I want you to see something that's happening. Because before this, and I was reading a biblical scholar, a guy named Charles Hedrick, said, the, th the whole piece serves to, quote, emphasize the popularity of Jesus' healing ministry and expands the breadth of that ministry beyond the specific examples. Before this, whenever we would get a healing story, we would get a healing story of a particular person getting healed. Think of Jairus' daughter or the woman with the hemorrhage. Right? It's specific one-person stories. And after all of this, after all of these things that are happening, Mark ends the chapter, the sixth chapter, by saying, and he's now healing everybody. It's no longer one person, it's anybody, it's everybody. That whole towns and farms and villages are emptying themselves of their sick people, and Jesus is healing all of them. And so this is taking Jesus' ministry and saying, okay, it's been like this. And now it's shooting up. All of a sudden, the scope is just absolutely magnified. Now it's not just a town in Galilee. It's all of the Galilee region. And so this little story serves as a bridge to everything that else is to come. He summarizes what Jesus says and he expands on it. And this says that the gospel, the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, is not just for one little town or one little region. This is growing. This is expanding. It's for everybody. And so the shepherd, right? The shepherd leads anybody, everybody. So go back to the Jeremiah. Wisdom, justice, righteousness. That's what a shepherd is supposed to do. And what we see in the Mark text is that's exactly who Jesus is. That Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied by Jeremiah hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years before. But what's really important is that he's not just a figure of history. He's not just a figure of prophetic utterance. It matters to the people in their lives in the present tense that Jesus' healing is right there, right in that moment, meeting that need. And so it's interesting and important in all of this. And even though we're getting just these little snippets of these stories, these kind of bridge pieces to the next part, is Mark saying, notice something. The ministry is always expanding. Because the need is always growing. And there's the shepherd doing what shepherds are supposed to do. Right? In this case, having compassion, teaching, and then feeding, 
showing his power, healing. That's what this is about. That's what this is supposed to be about. Um, and so we start to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus does. And then Paul takes it to the next level and says, and it's not just for one group of people, is it? It's for all of us. This is why I love doing this, right? Because what we see is that it just opens and it continues to expand out. Um, and that's where we need to take it then in our lives, right? And then from this place and wherever we are into the world, that's still in need, right? We're still in the midst of crisis. We're still in the midst of, you know, chaos. It is. It is. And so what we need to do then is remember what Jesus has called us to do for each other. But to always know then that even in the midst of that chaos, Christ is with us. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. Always in the boat. And that's good news. No, but somebody should be here tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Usually there's somebody here on Wednesdays, so, yeah. So, yep, maybe not until this afternoon, but, but thank you. No, <laughs> right. Okay. All right. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, that's what we're, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to thank the people who are watching online. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I noticed we had, you know, Alaric was in, Jim Wilkerson, um, we're watching, um, and we shared our we share our feed with um, St. James as well. So the St. James folks, I'm glad that you're with us. I am failing miserably at keeping this to 45 minutes, but that's okay because man, there was some good stuff today. There's really good stuff today, and so um, take it, mull on it, pray, um, read the scriptures, um, read them out loud, and um, and I'll see you next week. And on Sunday, don't forget everybody here and then, but also at home, um, worship 10 o'clock um, Sunday mornings here at um, Genesis, and worship is at 9.30 at St. James Lutheran Church um, in their summer schedule. So um, welcome, glad everybody's here today, and we'll see you next time.